Yeah, a couple of months ago I held this talk at work and I thought, yeah, it, I put a lot of work into it so I should uh, maybe do a screencast just going through the same slide. It's based on an online course I took uh, and the course material is here. The course itself is on Coursera. Uh, and if you go to, yeah, if you go to the web page you can find the table of contents. So I'll just briefly go through these chapters 1 to 9, then a little bit 10, 11 and 13. But not in any depth. If you're interested, read the book or even take the course. Uh, the Cryptography 1 course at Coursera. So basically it's about uh, encryption and a little bit uh, um, uh, about uh, a symmetric key and a little bit about public key and digital signatures. Uh, and if you wonder how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb, <laughs> it's a reference to a movie. So you, you'll have to Google it, just Google it, baby. First, uh, we can think about uh, cryptology as an overarching field which has uh, subfields cryptography and cryptanalysis. So cryptography, it's like it says, the science of creating messages with hidden meaning and cryptanalysis, the science of breaking those encrypted messages. Uh, and uh, uh, while doing so, instead of just calling the people communicating A and B, we uh, call them something that's easier to remember like Alice and Bob and then Eve here is an eavesdropper who is listening in on this traffic that goes over uh, the insecure channel between Alice and Bob so Eve hears everything so you can't just say that oh at some hours Alice and Bob uh, can uh, exchange messages without Eve hearing no uh, in, in this role, when Alice and Bob are trying to achieve confidentiality, that's the go their goal, uh, they have to assume that Eve is constantly listening, but they still uh, will have to be able to achieve confidentiality. And that means that Eve, even though she hears the traffic, will not be able to make any sense of it. And integrity is similar but different. <laughs> So here, instead of E, we have Mallory, and M, you can think of, stands for modifying. So instead of just listening on the traffic of the insecure channel between Alice and Bob, Mallory can listen and also modify the information uh, before it's sent on. So if Alice sends the message to Bob, Mallory can listen to uh, the traffic, stop the traffic, and change some bits, and then send it on to Bob. And uh, here uh, the goal is that Bob uh, must be able to know if the message has been changed or not. Uh, Bob cannot uh, stop Mallory from changing some bits in the traffic, but Bob uh, must be able to detect if the message has been uh, changed. So there are mechanisms how we can achieve that too. So to be able to communicate securely between Alice and Bob, you have to achieve both confidentiality and integrity. All right. So we start a little bit with, with the terminology. So a cipher uh, consists of two algorithms. And by the way, if you are now, it, it's not very much math, but uh, if you're interested. Um, uh, and you don't uh, really understand the maths, there are appendices here in the book where you can read about all the math that is required to understand this at a pretty, uh, not only a, a, a basic level, but uh, at an uh, advanced level, so you really understand the algorithms. Uh, all right. So uh, when Alice sends a message to Bob, M here is the message itself in clear text. And then it goes into this algorithm E, that stands for encryption. And the encryption algorithm takes the message as input and a key, K, as input. And out comes C, which is the ciphertext. This is the encrypted message. And Bob, he receives C 
and uh, Alice and Bob would have to have exchanged the key K before they started to communicate in some way. So this is one of the big problems with uh, this symmetric um, cryptography that Alice and Bob has to exchange key K before starting to communicate. Anyway, uh, Bob takes C and the same K as Alice used here in the E algorithm and he inputs uh, those two into the decryption algorithm and out comes the clear text message M again. Like magic. And there are many algorithms that can do this. So, but the most famous is the AES, the Advanced uh, uh, Encryption Standard. So if we go a little bit back into history, um, uh, Julius Caesar was famous for uh, creating this uh, Caesar cipher. Uh, which basically uh, you had two rows here in a table. The first row is the clear text alphabet and the second row is the cipher text alphab uh, alphabet. And every time um, Alice wants to write a letter, for instance A, she looks into the table and exchanges it with X in the cipher text and so on. And when Bob uh, uh, wants to decrypt the message, he sees X in the cipher text, looks in the table and translates it back to A. So the thing here is that um, in a, it's called mono-alphabetic substitution. Substitution is because you use this table to substitute letters between the clear text and ciphertext alphabet. And mono-alphabetic means that you always, every time there is an A, you exchange it with an X. E so every time there's an X in the ciphertext, there will be the same letter, in this case A, in the clear text. So, uh, yeah, this is the name of the company where I held the presentation. Uh, another way, instead of just rotating the alphabet, uh, as we did here, it's, a, it's, it's A, B, C, and so on, uh, but it's, it starts at the third position, so it's the, the second row is ba basically rotated, but you can uh, shuffle the letters in any way here in the second row. It's still monoalphabetic substitution. So one way is to put a keyword here in the beginning and then just line up the letters. But after um, you uh, used up all the letters in the keywords, uh, you will have uh, the last uh, few letters will line up here, as you see. X is X, Y is Y, and Z is Z. Z. Yeah, so uh, you might wonder how many ways can you shuffle a row of 26 letters? So how many different ways are there to create a monoalphabetic substitution of this clear text row, A to Z? Well, uh, it's 26 times 25 tw times 24 and so on. That's uh, uh, this, um, what's it called? Uh, 26. Uh, oh, I don't remember what, what it's called in English. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it's 26 times 25 and so on. And the result is a 4 with 26 zeros after it. Or if you translate this big number into um, uh, binary, base 2, it's a, a series of 1s or zeros with 88 digits. So 88 ones or zeros. So you might wonder why would we want to convert this base 10 number into base 2? It's because computers store uh, numbers with ones and zeros, with bits. So we need 88 ones and zeros to store all the possible combinations here of the ciphertext. So 2 to the power 88 is a pretty large number, but because there is a uh, redundancy in the English language. It's actually pretty easy to break monoalphabetic substitutions. So for instance, the most uh, famous word in the English uh, language, the most common word is the word the, T-H-E. So here we see R-A-K here, and then we see R-A-K again in the ciphertext. Maybe if you scroll down, there's... Uh, Again, you or AK somewhere, so we can see that most popular combination of three letters. Well, it's a pretty high probability that will actually correspond to THE in the clear text. Uh, so, using these kind of statistical methods, it's pretty easy to break, no matter how you have shuffled the ciphertext row uh, for all monoalphabetic substitutions. 
So uh, the most common letter, single letter is E. The most common combination of two letters is TH. The most common single word is THE, which also <laughs> contains the most common bigram. This is called a bigram combination of two letters. Uh, so then you can guess some single letters. You can guess short words. For instance, here are the, the, the most common two letter words and uh, here are some more common three letter words. And it starts to break this like a um, crossword almost. Uh, so th this was an app that was previously available on mobile phones uh, by uh, NSA. Uh, so th they wanted people to practice uh, breaking cryptos. Anyway, here are more some more things you can use. Single letters. These are the top single letters in English language in order. The top uh, beginning letters of in the beginning of words. The top ending letters. The last letter in a word is in this order. You have some uh, words that are only one letter long and very often those uh, let, uh, one letter words will be either A or I. You have doubles and you see if, if there's an XX in the ciphertext, it's probably S, S, E, E, T, T, F, F, L, L, M, M or O, O in, in the clear text. One of those, very likely. And so on, you can continue with top two letter words you can, uh, and three letter words, biograms, and even trigrams. And here you see TH, THE, like I mentioned, uh, are by far the, the, the highest statistic occurrence. So, so you usually start with trying to identify these TH and E. And E was, like I said, also the, mo the most common single letter over here. Yeah, and um, you can create your own statistics uh, like this. Uh, if, if you know, for instance, what kind of text the clear text is, is if it's, for instance, a military text, well, uh, then it might not be a traditional English. The statistics might be a little bit uh, different because military texts are usually more condensed, use fewer words. So the statistics will look a little bit different. So if you want to uh, be able to break military text with a higher... Uh, probability, you might want to build a, a custom corp, uh, custom statistics using um, corpus texts uh, of military text. Or corpus text is a, a text that is used to train the statistics. So here is uh, an example. Uh, so, um, for instance, uh, we, we don't know what this uh, means, uh, but we can guess that it's a substitution. So there's this Quip Quip uh, Quip Cube web service created by some um, uh, guy at a uh, university in the United States. So if I just copy this and go to Quip Quip, maybe I can do that. Yeah, and the site works, and I can paste this, and let's just try to automatically solve it. So uh, it actually. Uh, uh, you can see here, uh, this is the score. So this is how probable it is that this is the correct de decryption. So this is a little bit less probable and even less probable. So this is the most probable decryption. And ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country and you uh, go back and see, it seems also so to be in line with the theme here of, of, of so yeah, you can probably also guess if you Google that sentence, who who said this? Probably some president. Yeah, and then now we come to the first uh, cipher that is not a, a monoalphabetic substitution. This is actually a polyalphabetic substitution. That means, uh, for instance, here if we have the message, if we look at L here, there's one L, and then there's another L, and here we see in the cipher text. The first L was translated to W in the ciphertext and the second L was translated to O in the ciphertext. So uh, now we're not, uh, we are not uh, tr uh, substituting for the same letter all the time anymore. So this is uh, naturally harder to break. So we're using this table here. So uh, we, we have a keyword. So for instance here I have the the keyword wild east and when the keyword is uh, finished I just start repeat it and write wild east again. 
So um, now the, the keyboard is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight letters long. And after eight letters, it starts to repeat. That means um, if I uh, have a longer message and pick up, pick up uh, first uh, identify that the keyboard is eight letters long, and then I uh, have a long uh, message, I can pick out every eighth letter and that will be encoded using the same row here in, in this large table, uh, this W row. Uh, so those every eighth letter will actually be a monoalphabetic substitution. So you could break this with the monoalphabetic substitution. But now uh, you will have some disadvantages because all of the statistics will not be applicable because you don't have the, the letters that are, uh, for instance, bigrams and freegrams won't work, but single letters will work. Yeah, B and uh, the message has to be longer. In this case, I guess, about eight times longer because the keyboard is eight letter long. Yeah, so for encryption, uh, I, I have W in the clear text, no, in the, in the key, and I want uh, H in the clear text, so I have H in the clear text, W in the key, and I see what, where those two meet, and I get D in the ciphertext. When I decrypt, okay, I have W in the uh, keyword, I know the, the receiver, Bob, knows the keyword. He knows that the W is the first letter in the keyword, and he sees D in the ciphertext, and he goes up here, and then he sees H, so H is the clear text letter for decryption. And as you can see, these are actually 26 different Caesar ciphers. So it's even easier to break than if you had had um, just 26 random shuffles. Um, you, as you remember, there are many, many ways to shuffle the alphabet, but if you just rotate it, like in this Vigenere cipher, then it's much, much easier because there are only 26 different ways to rotate one row. Did I say everything here? Yeah, you, you can use these algorithms uh, to find the length of the keyword, Kaczynski or Kirchhoff algorithm. Uh, or maybe that's the same algorithm, I'm not sure. Google it. Kaczynski or Kirchhoff algorithm. Now uh, we have uh, many movies has been made and, and documentaries about this se famous Second World War encryption machine that Germany made called the Enigma. And it uh, came in very um, in many different variations. So, for instance, in these variations, you have th three slots here, and you have three rotors. So, how does it work? Well, in each rotor here, it can be rotated in one of twenty-six different positions, and each position corresponds to one substitution. So, for, so when you start, you can insert these uh, three rotors in uh, these three rotor wheels in any slot. So, how many ways are there to insert three uh, wheels in three slots? Well, you can insert slot. Let's call them A, B, C. You can insert them A, B, C, or A, C, B, B, A, C, and so on, and it will become uh, six different, six different ways. 3 times 2 times 1 uh, to insert 3 uh, rotors in 3 slots. Yeah, and uh, each slot can uh, be rotated in 26 different uh, ways. Uh, each rotor can be rotated in 26 different ways. And so uh, the positions of, of these 3 rotors is 26 to the power of 3 and times 6, that's the way uh, you can, uh, number of ways you can insert the rotors. So it becomes a not so large number actually, it's just 105,000 uh, different ways you can start this uh, wi with the rotors. So that's called the initial setting. So that number is not big enough to be a good key. You know, if you uh, translate this number into uh, uh, binary, uh, you can do this using the log2 function. Uh, I wrote here big K, that's the key space. So, uh, and this is the size of the key space. Uh, so the size of the key space, if you translate it to um, uh, binary, uh, you can represent that with just 16.7 uh, bits. So that's not nearly big enough. So uh, to be to be um, 
uh, safe you need at least like 90 bits or something like that uh, the, the key size so 16 bits is not big enough no, not for a fast computer and the Brits they used this bomb machine they built it to break it famously uh, w with the help of Alan Turing but actually the Poles had al already built a machine to break uh, Enigma but this was a previous uh, uh, variation of the Enigma machine uh, without this plug board I think but uh, everything else here looked the same but it didn't have the plug board so this plug board uh, introduces uh, more variations to the Enigma cipher um, and uh, yeah, the Bombay machine could break it even with those variations uh, using for instance something that's called a crib. So a crib is a known word in the clear text. Like for instance Heil Hitler or uh, I don't know if you know that they, that they send a weather report every day then they might uh, at the same time you might uh, i don't know they might it might start with the same words like good morning or something so then then that then you know some words in the clear text already and that is huge advantage uh, because when, when you know a few ver uh, words and you know uh, try to try different rotor positions uh, well if you just know the first five w letters, let's say, uh, well, uh, the probability that it will uh, translate to the correct letter is like 26 to the power of 3. Um, no, it's 1 and 26. And we want to get to um, 2 to the power of 16. Yeah, yeah you can calculate how many letters you need of a crib be before you are you, you with 50% probability can guess the rotor position uh, uh, but I'm not going to do that now mm. <laughs> okay so now we come to the symmetric cipher which I already mentioned so the the, the thing with the symmetric cipher is that Alice used the same key K and uh, uh, as Bob and Bob Alice used the same key K for encryption as Bob uses for decryption and Eve here hears everything but cannot make any sense of it. And Eve here, uh, we are not cheating, Eve knows everything about this cipher. Eve sees the, all of the cipher text, Eve knows all the details of, of the encryption algorithm E, Eve knows all the uh, details of the decryption algorithm but Eve does not know K. So that's the only thing that Eve does not know, it's K. And it should still be secret. So, so, so the secret should still be safe. That's the goal of the secret key cryptography or symmetric cipher. So this is called secret key cryptography because um, yeah, it's kind of the opposite of public key where, where Alice and Bob don't use the same key K. We're, we're coming to that in a later slide. Yeah, and I already mentioned this. Uh, for instance, these are all the possible keys in here in this circle. The, the correct key, lowercase key K will belong to the uh, space um, here, the key space. And the p uh, uh, size of the key space uh, is 2 uh, to the power of n, where n is the number of bits. So in the case of Enigma, it was just 16 bits. So the, uh, there were only 2 to the power of 16 possible ways uh, to start the, the rotors and uh, the, the initial rotor positions if you had three wheels. Actually, if you had more than three wheels, if we go back, and in the later uh, later variation, instead of, th everything was the same, but in instead of three rotors, that ha they had five rotors. So now it's five times four times three different ways to insert these three rotor wheels. So instead of six uh, different ways, it's 60 different ways. So they 10 doubled the key space just by increasing the number of rotors from 3 to 5. Yeah, uh, and uh, well, when I took the course, I said the safe value for n here, the, the, the number of bits in the key is like 80, but that was a number of years ago. So if the Moore's law says that uh, the, the, the computational power of computers doubles every second year, that means, what does it mean? when the computational power doubles. Well, it means uh, we can break double the key space in the same amount of time as we 
right? So after two years, if, if one year uh, the safe value for n is 80, then after two years, well, we have to double. If the, the computing power doubles, we have to um, increase, increase it to 81. And then after two, m two more years, years, we have to increase it to 82. And now, it, because it was like about 10 years ago, I took the course, well, um, I guess we would be up at 85 now. And maybe just to be safe and have some margin, we, we should increase it to 90. So we could say that now a safe value for n would be 90. Okay, so uh, a brute force attack, what does that mean? Well, uh, you just run through all the possible keys and tries to decrypt and then check this decrypted message. Does it make sense or not? Is it probable that this could be the actual clear text message? So if n was 16 here, um, we would do this inner loop here, 2 to the power of 16 uh, iterations. And we, we, we would get a 2 to the power of 16 m primes and one of them is the correct one. But we don't know which one, so we have to do some check here uh, to, to uh, analyze, is it probable that this actually is the correct correct uh, message? So how can we, can we do this check? Well, for instance, if we assume that it's a printable ASCII, if you go to the ASCII table, you will see that all uh, English letter ASCII words and, 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 uh, and digits and special uh, uh, characters too, like um, uh, space and exclamation mark and qu quotation mark and so on, they are all they all have a zero at the most significant bits. They are encoded in, in ASCII with eight bits, but it's actually the only the seven lower bits that are used. The most significant bit is always zero. Mm, but when you decode with the wrong key, it will this M prime here will look like a purely uh, almost like a purely random bit string. That means it will be 50% probable that the most significant bit is uh, one and 50% that it's zero. So if the entire message consists of printable ASCII, then all the most significant bits must be zero. So that is a quick test you can do. Check if the most significant bit of each byte is zero. If not, okay, just throw it away. Then it's not the correct uh, uh, M prime here. We could look for known words, like uh, in Alan Turing did with the Enigma. We can check for a magic header, for instance, if uh, it's a zip file. Well, all zip file has the s begins with the same bytes. That's called a magic header. So basically, that's the same as a crib. But it's even better than a crib because we know that it's in the beginning of the message. We can check the entropy. That's the randomness of the ones and zeros in in M prime for the correct message, if it's for instance ASCII, that then it will have a low entropy um, because of uh, yeah, a, 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 an English message written in the ASCII encoding is not purely random. Uh, but uh, when if you decrypt it with the wrong key, then the ones and zeros will be almost purely random. So it's easy to distinguish when you just check how random the ones and zeros are in M prime. It's easy to dis distinguish between between the correct message and, and the, the uh, wrong decoding. You can also in M prime here search for uh, English words and do other types of statistical analysis. And if you do all this, you will probably find at least one candidate. And maybe if you find 15 candidates that passes all the tests, well, it's easy to just uh, manually for a human to look through these 15 decodings and a, a human will quickly see which one is actually the correct decoding. Yeah, and here was the ASCII table I was talking about and I uh, if you can see the hex encoding here, uh, if you have a, a number larger than seven, eight or larger, it will begin with a one and uh, th these eight bits of the, the letter. But if the, it begins with with zero to seven, then it's, it has a zero uh, in, in the most significant position. And all the, these letters here have a zero in the most significant position. And now it comes to the one ta time pad. So this guy, Claude Shannon, he did uh, a proof that the one time pad gives perfect secrecy. And what does that mean? Well, uh, it means that um, there is not possible to create 
a more secure cipher than the one-time pad. It has the maximum theoretical security. <laughs> the one-time pad, it's not possible. It has perfect security. All right. So uh, you might say that we are done. Just use the one-time pad and everything is fine. But of course, that's not the case. Anyway, let's uh, just um, start to look at how it works. If you use, for instance, XOR. So uh, if you're a programmer, you probably know how XOR works already, but it works like kind of like plus, minus, multiplication and division that is, is commutative and associative. Um, hmm, well, at least multiplication is commutative and associative. It means if you take a times b, it's the same as b times a. If you insert parentheses, a times b in parentheses times c is the same result as a times parentheses b times c. So it's the same with xor. a xor b xor c is the same as a xor b and the result of that xor c. If you take two values that are exactly the same, so k, x or k, it becomes a bit string with only zeros. And you take a message m, x or a bit string of only zeros, the result is the message itself. So those three properties are used in the one-time pad. So uh, it works like this. Uh, Alice first creates a, a uh, k here, which is a random bit string, that means it's a random uh, string of ones and zeros, at least as long as m, and you work on every bit in m, you take every bit in m, xor one, uh, uh, one bit of the key k. Alright, and uh, the output is the ciphertext c here. So Bob, what does he receive? He receives c, and what can Bob do? Well, if Bob also knows the key k, so again, we have this problem. Uh, Alice has generated a random bit string k, but Bob must know it to decrypt it. So how does Bob get this random bit string k? Yeah, that's to, they have to exchange it beforehand in some way. Anyway, so uh, Bob takes c x or k. And what does that mean? Well, what was c? c was m x or k. So I can put that in parentheses, m x or k. So that's m x or k, x or k. What is that? Well, if I move the parentheses, I can put the parentheses here, k, x or k. But we said here, k, x, x or k is, is just zero. And m, x or zero is just m. So Bob is left with only m itself. So k xored itself out when you, t you took k, x or k here. Uh, so that's the way this one time pad works. And it's perfectly secure because for instance, Eve here, Eve only sees C and she can do this brute force and guess all different possible abilities for K. Maybe she takes C, X or K1, she gets the string hello world. And she takes C, X or another key, K2, she gets the clear text message uh, goodbye Mars. And it's no possible way for Eve to know if hello world is the correct decryption or goodbye Mars is the correct decryption, they are both uh, exactly uh, equally uh, possible. So in fact, every possible decryption is equally likely using this one-time pad scheme. That is why it has perfect security. K1 and K2 are equally likely, it's so it's theoretically impossible to guess K. Uh, it could be any message of the same length. Well, uh, Eve knows, only knows the length of the ciphertext C, but it could be any message that has that length. But this, uh, uh, to, to, for this to be secure, the one-time pad, the key K must never repeat, because look what happens if key re K repeats, if the key is repeated. So let's say Alice sends one message to Bob, M1, X or K, and then uh, Alice sends another message to Bob, but she reuses the same K. Look what happens. Eve can take the first ciphertext, X or the cipher, second ciphertext, and look what happens. Be because, because they use the same K, and because uh, these commutative and associative properties, uh, uh, Eve can throw the Ks around, so move this K to the end, then we have K, X or K at the end, so K, X or K, uh, XORs out, 
So left is only M1, XOR M2 and no signs of the keys are left. So this is pretty scary stuff, right? Uh, so just by reusing the same key, K, twice, all security went out the window. Yeah, and that is also why one time pad, pad is not so <laughs> often used. And also uh, this is kind of not practical to have to exchange the key and to uh, use a different key for every message. They have to exchange a lot of key material, Alice and Bob, for this to work. Uh, what happened now? Okay. I think there's the next slide. <laughs> so... Uh, a variation that is a little bit more practical but of course now it doesn't have perfect security anymore but it has a pretty good uh, security good enough that is instead of having a key that is as long as the message m you have a smaller key that is used as a seed for a generator algorithm that we can call g so you input g into this generator algorithm and out of the generator algorithm G comes a seemingly random st uh, string of ones and zeros and you take this seemingly random or pseudo random uh, bit string that comes out of G X or M. So now Alice and Bob did not have to, to exchange a key that is as long as M. They just have to use like well, what, we, what did we say? What was secure? Uh, at least 90 bit long key. Maybe 128 bit maybe 256 bit, something like that. And that would be enough to get um, pretty good security here. Uh, and then they can encrypt maybe a gigabyte of data. But at some point, maybe they should not uh, encrypt 10 gigabyte or 100 gig gigabyte. At some point, they should change the key K. So for instance, one common uh, algorithm for G is called RC4, but it actually has a statistical bias. Uh, in the first few bytes, and that uh, these three guys, Fleur, Mountain and Shamir, uh, uh, created an attack to actually break string ciphers based on RC4, just based uh, on this uh, statistical bias in the first few bytes. But you can uh, do a workaround to, uh, to use RC4 anyway. So a workaround is to generate 100 or 200 bytes to something like that. So Alice um, when choosing a key K, they generate a, a few hundred bytes uh, first and throw it away. And then Bob uh, generates the equal amount of uh, bytes and throws it away and then starts to use the rest as uh, key stream material. Alright, so that then they overcome this statistical bias in the first few bytes of the output of RC4 or ARC4. Yeah, so that's a workaround. So if you are going to use ARC4, remember to apply this workaround throw away the first few bytes. So yeah, <laughs> so one time pad was perfectly secure against Eve, but it's not perfectly secure uh, against Mallory. Because Mallory, remember, uh, has one more superpower compared to Eve. Mallory has the superpower of also changing the message. So let's say uh, that Mallory knows that uh, at this position here, in the message is, for instance, let's uh, imagine it's a bank transaction and it's on this format somewhere in the message, send 100 euros. So let's say that Mallory knows that in this position there is a one, uh, this position of the clear text message. Then Mallory can create a, a bit string with all zeros except in this position where there was a one. Here um, Mallory creates this perturbation key P. So the, the, key, the perturbation key key is all zeros except at this position that Mallory wants to change. So X here, what should it be to be able to change it? Well, you can see the math over here, but uh, you can also intuitively just imagine if the x is ASCII 1, x or ASCII 9. What happens? Well, you get ASCII 1, x or ASCII 1, x or ASCII 9. And the result is 1, x or 1, ASCII 1, x or ASCII 1 is all zeros. x or ASCII 9 is ASCII 9. So the message will be changed when decrypted to send 900 euros. So Mallory could have, could change 
the decrypted message in a predictable way without knowing the key K. She only had to know one um, uh, letter at one position. And then she can change it to whatever she wants without knowing, without knowing the key K. All right. So this is a pretty serious attack, and that is why we need uh, integrity. Uh, yeah, and now we come to block cipher. So uh, some algorithms uses uh, works on blocks of, for instance, 16 bytes at a time. So input put 16 bytes. For instance, in AES here, you input 16 bytes. And you imp input the key and you get 16 bytes out of ciphertext. And if you just do this over and over and treat every block of uh, 16 bytes individually, you will see patterns here. Everywhere, for instance, you have if this is RGB data uh, for an image, everywhere here the where it's perfectly white, it will, will be some random value, but it will be the same random value because nothing changes. The message here is uh, 16 bytes of white RGB data. The key is the same, so the ciphertext will also be the same. So everywhere where it's white, you will see the same pattern here in the output. And here well, where we have other colors, well, you can still see, see the other colors here and that it's a different pattern. All right, so that's called electronic code book, ECB, when you encrypt each block individually. And that's not good because we will leak some information here. Uh, so uh, to overcome this, uh, and this is the command I used just to encrypt this. So I first separated the header. Uh, I created the BMP image. Then I uh, separated the header and the uh, pixel data. And I encrypted just the pixel data, and then I appended back the header and the encrypted pixel data to get this picture. All right. So instead of AAS, there are other block cipher algorithms that you could also use. For instance, DES, Two Fish, Triple DES, Blowfish, Camellia. All these are pretty good, except for instance DES. Then it was uh, proved in the 1990s that DES has a too short key to uh, be considered safe. It has a key with of only 56 bits. And you remember, it would lead need at least 90 bits of key uh, length to be considered secure against a brute force attack. Yeah, uh, so uh, instead of uh, electronic code book, what could you do? You can, do, for instance, use this uh, scheme that's called cipher block chaining or CBC mode. So then you take, uh, let's just look at, at the block in the middle here. You take the cipher text of the previous block, XOR the plain text, and to take the output of this XOR into the um, uh, encryption algorithm, and then the key as input, and out you get the cipher text for this block. So uh, because of that you XOR with the um, cipher text of the previous block, um, you will get rid of this uh, leaking <laughs> information uh, that you saw in uh, electronic code book. Uh, you can go into the, a bit of the theory of XOR, but um, to put it very simply, uh, XOR can only increase entropy. It can never decrease entropy. And uh, the output of AES here, I I it's, um, oh, I if you have AES as the algorithm here, it's like a almost purely random strings of ones and zeros. So if you take something that is almost purely random, uh, XOR, a plain text, already the input here to the block cipher here is almost purely random. And the output will also be purely random. Or, or almost purely random, okay? That's why you get rid of it. <laughs> I hope I hope you understand. But that's the property of XOR. Uh, the entropy will never decrease. It will only increase every time you, you, you add another XOR. Um, yeah, uh, uh, and in the first block here, yeah, and then you have no previous block, okay? Then you to take the, the XOR or something that calls an IV or initialization vector. And to decrypt, you do the opposite. You start at the last block. You begin with the ciphertext. You do the decryption. And you get something out. And what uh, to get the plain text of the last block? Well, you, you take 
what comes out of the decryption algorithm, XOR the previous ciphertext, and then you get the plain text for the last block. And you do the same thing over and over again until you get to the first block, and for the first block you do the same, so you take the ciphertext, decrypt, and take the decryption XOR the IV instead of the previous block, and you get the plain text for the first block. Ooh, and you can use this uh, command line to do a uh, CBC encryption. Use an op the OpenSSL command line. Yeah, and there are some other similar modes to CBC, like PCBC, CFB, OFB. You can go to um, go to Wikipedia and look out. It, it's similar to this, but slightly different. Um, except counter mode and GCM mode, those two are special. Counter mode actually gives a stream cipher. Uh, here you you don't encrypt the plain text at all. Instead, you you take an integer and encrypt. So so you you can use counter mode to turn AES into a stream cipher, even though it's a block cipher from the beginning. So counter mode is a way to turn it into a stream cipher. But you must never never ever repeat the starting integer that you use to encrypt the first block here. So the first um, um, integer must only be used once, other, otherwise you get this two-time pad attack that all, all stri stream ciphers are vulnerable against. All right? So that's um, uh, an integer that you only used once, and, uh, uh, an integer just uh, normally called n. So an n that you only use one, it's called an n once or nonce. All right? So it must never ever repeat, because when it repeats you get a two-time pad. Uh, GCM mode is a more advanced mode, you can read about it in, G in Wikipedia, but it actually gives both encryption and authentication at the same time. So there is no need to do an extra step to, to uh, introduce authentication, that's, because that's why GCM is a pretty popular mode when doing real encryption uh, communication between Alice and Bob. Yeah. Now we come to... Um, to the integrity part. So you probably know what a hash is, but uh, just to recap, uh, in w when you do use a hash algorithm, you take a message, so here uh, is the set of all possible messages uh, that you can uh, use as input into a hash algorithm, and this is a pretty large space because it's the space of all possible messages. The message can be short, the message can be long, the message can be the entire Bible, uh, an, an entire book. The message can be a binary, the message can be a zip file. So this is a, a huge space here, the number of possible messages. And the output from a hash, for instance, for SHA-1, a limited number of bits, like uh, 256 bits or 128 bits or something like that. So uh, let's say that the output is 128 bits, then there are only 2 to the power 128 different possible hashes here in the ha in hash space or digest space. So if the input is a message, then the output is called the message digest or hash. So that message digest or hash is the same thing. Yeah, and MD5 is the most uh, common uh, hash algorithm, but it is not so secure because it was broken uh, a number of years ago, maybe 10 years ago or more. Uh, so this uh, way they broke it is that you can uh, find two different messages that gives the same hash using an algorithm that takes only 2 to the power of 18 iterations in the inner loop. So that is far too less, you know. If, th if an attack takes 2 to the power of 90 or more, okay, then it's not feasible to actually perform the attack. But is, if it's less than 2 to the power of 90, if it's 2 to the power of 18, that's a very small number for a computer. A computer is very fast. For SHA-1, they also found a co collision, but here's 2 to the power of 63, which is a much larger number. It's almost safe, but it's still 2 to the power of 63. It's a little bit too small to be confident to use SHA-1. So you should uh, probably use something later than SHA-1. For instance, SHA-2, which have a number of different variations, 256, 384, and 512. So for instance, SHA-2, 256, it has an output of 256 bits. Then there's also this SHA-3 algorithms, uh, which has the same output length, but uh, 
uh, is this Kachak algorithm. Uh, it uh, doesn't actually use this uh, merkel damgård construction as both MD5, SHA-1 and SHA-2 uses uh, a construct that calls a merkel damgård That's the inner working of the algorithm. You can check on Wikipedia how it merkel damgård works or in the book. <coughs> the crypto book. Um, but uh, SHA-3 does not use a merkel damgård construction. Instead, it uses something called a sponge function, which you might argue is not as well studied as a merkel damgård construction. But on the other hand, two of these merkel damgård constructions has been found to be weak. So uh, sponge functions have not been found to be weak yet. Uh, anyway, there are the other uh, algorithms too that you could try. And here are the, the properties that are uh, wanted for a secure, secure hash function. And if you can fulfill all these properties, then you can call this uh, hash function a cryptographically secure hash function. Yeah, so it, that means that it's okay to use in cryptography. So for MD5, when you can find a, a collision, you fail at this step, second pre-image resistance. What does that mean? Well, when you have two sets and a mathematical function, then um, this is called the image and this is the pre-image. So the, the digest is the image and the message that, that came into the function is the pre-image. So second pre-image, that means if you have message one, it gave one hash. Then I have a second pre-image, message two, that uh, hashes to the same hash. Uh, well, um, that should not be possible. It is, of course, theoretically possible, but it should not be possible to find a second pre-image in just two to, two to the power 18 iterations. Okay, that's too easy to be considered safe. You can always go through all the two to the power 256. If you use SHA-256, uh, you can always find the collision after two to the power 256 iterations. All right, but that's okay. Two, 256 is larger than 90. But if it's lower than 90, if it's 18, okay, then it's not, not okay anymore. So how do we do this uh, to, to verify integrity? Well, we use this hash function, but not directly. Instead, uh, we use a hash function with the message as input and a key. So now Alice knows the key, Bob knows the key. But Eve or Mallory does not know the key. So Mallory cannot create a message without knowing the key, key, uh, the key here to create a valid, valid uh, MAC tag. So T for T so stands for MAC tag, T MAC. And that MAC is a short for message authentication code. So you basically to take the message and the key and you have a algorithm here and the algorithm, uh, it's a little bit complex, but you split up the key in two parts, K1, K2, and you take a fixed value I did it called the iPad value, XOR the K1, and uh, then you take the output of that as input to the hash, as use that as uh, 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 together with the message. I don't know if you append that uh, output of the XOR to the message or prepend. Uh, one of those, I'm not sure which one. But uh, out of the hash function, you get the hash. And then that hash is used as input to the second hash function here. Uh, and you append another XOR of K2, XOR another value, OPAD. And uh, y why they do this, it's because you can get rid of a number of attacks uh, that, that are just play, made impossible when you do this uh, double XOR scheme and uh, appending. Um, and the output, output looks just like a normal hash, but the thing here is even if Mallory knew the message, she couldn't create a valid tmac without knowing the key k here into the mac algorithm so um bob on the other hand no I, i'll do it like this we, 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 there are two different schemes we 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 explain the first scheme first mac then encrypt okay so then you take uh you calculate the mac with the input to 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 the hmac uh, func function uh, the message m and the key all right, then you get uh, a tmac value, and then you encrypt using the encryption algorithm the message and append the tmac value. All right, then you get C, and you only only send the C. And what Bob has to do to decrypt this, he decodes C with the, uh, with the encryption key, which he knows. 
Then he gets this message and a appended tmac value, and then he verifies uh, if the tmac is correct for the message m. And how does he verif do the verification? Well, if he, he, he has a candidate m here, he knows the mac key, he can calculate the tmac, and then he can compare is it the same tmac that was here? If it's not the same tmac, okay, then the verification fails. But Mallory cannot do this uh, because Mallory does not know the key, the Mac key. And then uh, if it does not verify, it throws, throws, just throws it away. But the second way here is better. Encrypt and Mac, then it works like this. First encrypt the message, just as usual, get the ciphertext C. Then you, you calculate the Mac uh, using the ciphertext instead as input and, uh, and the Mac key. And then what you send over is the ciphertext and append the Mac. And why is this better? That's because when you verify, Bob begin can begin immediately with, uh, with verifying without encryption for decryption first. It Im immedi immediately verifies as the first step. And then if the verification fails, he can throw it away immediately. All right, he doesn't even try to decrypt because as soon as Bob starts to try to decrypt, then uh, there are a number of attacks that can happen, padding Oracle and so on. So I, I'm not going to go into this, but you can uh, Google it if you're interested. Uh, so um, now we have this situation with symmetric uh, keys, uh, ciphers, uh, Alice and Bob, they want to um, use the same key K, but what if they don't want to exchange it beforehand, but they just want to start with some handshaking, and at the end of this handshake, Alice and Bob ends up with the same key K, but the eavesdropper Eve does not understand what K they are going to use. How can this work? It's very strange, but uh, <laughs> you can use uh, a little bit of math. So in this Diffie Hellman, there was two guys that called Diffie and Hellman. Uh, that came up with this algorithm in the 1970s. So you take uh, an integer g, um, a prime number p, uh, and uh, I think if I remember correctly, yeah, I left out. Uh, you take ev every calculation mod p, but I, I, I left out the mod p just to, to make the slide a little simpler. So uh, we start with, uh, <coughs> with this. Uh, Alice first just generates a random number, which we can call lowercase a. Bob generates its own uh, random number, lowercase b. And those red numbers a and b are secret. If Eve finds out either a or b, the Hellman is broken. Okay. And then Alice computes this alpha value, which is g to the power of a. Bob computes this beta value, which is g to the power of b. Alice sends alpha over to Bob, and Bob uh, sends beta over to Alice. So what happened now? Eve cannot calculate or A or B because of the discrete log problem. What does that mean? Uh, yeah, if you have um, uh, Eve sees alpha, Eve knows G, Eve knows the prime P, but Eve does not know A. But alpha equal to g to the power of a mod p, to calculate a, a here, that's called the discrete log problem, and that is a hard computational problem. And Eve cannot com calculate that if uh, a is large enough. All right? Eve cannot, can only do this if a is a small number. And uh, you can check on Wikipedia how, how large they have to be. So I think... Uh, 512 bits is not large enough, then you can actually break it, but if it's like 2048 bits or something like that, then it's impossible with today's computer to break it. With a quantum computer, I think it's actually possible to break this, uh, but I don't remember. It was uh, 10 years ago I took the course, but um, you can check in the book or on Wikipedia to be sure. Anyway, so what does uh, Alice do? She got this beta value from uh, uh, Bob. And what was beta? It was uh, g to the power of b. And if, so if she take beta to, to the power of a, that is g to the power of b to the power of a, that can be rewritten as g to the power of b times a. 
Yeah, and Bob does similar thing, but he takes the alpha value he got from Alice to the power of b, and that is uh, g to the power of a times b. And what? Look here, b times a and a times b, it's the same value. So it ends up with Alice has this value k, and Bob has the same value k. But Eve cannot calculate this because of the discrete log problem. <coughs> I hope you <laughs> understood that uh, I didn't explain this so clear. Uh, yeah, but it's not secure against Mallory because Mallory can do what's called a man in the middle attack. So uh, I'm not going to go into details here, but basically when Alice sends the alpha value over to Bob, Mallory can stop it and uh, instead create her own A and calculate her own A prime and send, send that over to Bob. So though, uh, uh, and do the same with Alice, the same with Bob. So Alice will think she talks to Bob, Bob will think he talks to Alice, but in fact they are both talking to Mallory. And Mallory has one K prime uh, to talk to Alice and another key, key session key, K bis, or, or whatever it's called in English, uh, to talk to Bob. So um, Diffie Hellman is just not secure against uh, man in the middle attack. So uh, you have to combine this with something else and uh, the way it's usually done is to com combine Diffie Hel Hellman with, diff wi with digital signatures. So um, Alice can have some confidence in knowing that she's actually talking to Bob. So I'm not going to uh, go into exactly how this works but uh, again check the book or Wikipedia because that's what's in the second chapter of, of the book which I'm just going to touch briefly. Now we come to public key. So uh, the way it works here, for instance, if Alice wants to send a message to Bob, well, first Bob must generate this key pair that consists of a public key and a private key. Uh, what is, okay, I call it PK and SK, okay, secret key. So a secret key is same as private key. But the private key is also PK, so it's not so pedagogic. <laughs> SK is better. Okay, the secret key. Uh, so uh, to encrypt, you take um, the message and the public key and you get ciphertext. To decrypt, you take uh, the ciphertext and the secret key or the private key and, uh, and you get the message back. back. All right. Uh, so with pictures, you encrypt pu with public key, you decrypt with the secret key. But it's still not safe against Mallory. <sighs> because uh, Mallory can do the same, can just uh, replace replace the, the uh, when Alice wants to have uh, Bob's public key, well, uh, Mallory can just stop that message and send her own public key. Yeah, so uh, we still have a problem with key exchange. So key exchange is actually the hardest problem in cryptography. Yeah, so here are some problems that can happen with the RSA algorithm for um, uh, public key cryptography. And if you play the CTF challenges, all of these uh, commonly occur uh, in the crypto category of the CTF challenges. Yeah, so the algorithm works like this. Uh, first, um, if Alice wants to generate a key pair, she, she, she first generates uh, two prime numbers, P and Q. And then she computes uh, P times Q, that's the N, or the um, uh, public, no, no, not the exponent, that's the modulus. N is the modulus number. You also choose a public uh, exponent, and uh, this is perfectly fine to always use the same. E here is green, that means it's it's known by everybody. N is green, it's known by everybody, but P and Q is not known. So the public key is the pair of two numbers, uh, the um, public exponent and the number N. And the decryption comp uh, exponent D, this is very secret. So nobody should be able to calculate D except the one who owns the secret key. And the secret key is the pair D and N. All right, so that's the decryption exponent and E is the encryption e exponent. 
so these three numbers E, D and N have some uh, mathematical properties. So if you take M to the power of E mod N, you get ciphertext C, and then you take C to the power of D mod N, you get back the message M. Incredible, but it works. So um, the, these three guys, uh, Rivers, Shamir and Adleman, uh, came up with this in the 70s, and later it turned out that uh, actually some British mathematician uh, in the military already found out these mathematical properties before. But um, it was secret. The military is very secret, so they didn't go public with it, and he's still pretty unknown, the guy that actually uh, came up with it uh, first. Yeah, so you might wonder how do you calculate D when you have P and Q? Well, uh, you, you calculate for first this phi number, which is, oh, I don't remember the name of it, but it's like this Euler or something, I don't remember. Anyway, that's P minus 1 and Q numbers, Q minus 1. Uh, multiplicated together, okay, so if you know P and Q, it's very easy to calculate this phi number, which is like the number of um, relative primes between P and Q, or something like that. Uh, um, this is very hard to calculate phi if, if you don't know P and Q. But if you know P and Q, it's easy. So that's what you mean with um, a trapdoor function. So the secret of knowing the secret key is knowing is, be, is being able to calculate this phi. And if you if you are able to calculate phi, you can uh, calculate d using uh, the e and phi uh, through this function, modern, uh, modular inverse, and you, then you get d. And now, this is very important. If you uh, are done with calculating d, you should actually throw away p, q, and phi, because if the attacker knows p, or q, or phi, it's completely broken. If the attacker knows p, well, what can he do or she? Well, the attacker already knows n. If he also knows p, he can calculate q by just uh, taking n divided by p. Then he gets q. And he, if he, if he knows both p and q, he can calculate phi. Just taking p minus 1 times q minus 1. And if he has phi, he can calculate d. And he knows everything. He knows the secret key. All right? Same with q. And of course, if you know phi, yeah, it's also broken. And that's why you should throw it away. So only keep one thing, only keep D. That must never get out. Yeah, so that's called factorization if you are able to calculate P or Q just seeing N. Hallstad's broadcast attack is a special case. You can check on Wikipedia, but basically, if I remember correctly, it's like if you have two or three messages that are encrypted using the same... Uh, I don't remember, Ch check on the internet. Um, th there are some special cases w when a broad ho Hostad's bro uh, broadcast attack is applicable, but I, I, I don't remember exactly the cases now. You can have common factors, this is pretty interesting. So there, this is uh, an algorithm called GCD, Grace to Common Divider, that's actually pretty fast. So let's say that for instance, N1 is P1 times Q, and then you have another key, n2, which is p2 times q. Then both n1 and n2, they have different p factors, but they have the same q factor. If you take the greatest common divider between n1 and n2, well, you will get your, uh, q back as a result. And this is a fast function. So what has happened then? Well, then you, then you have actually broken RSA. As soon as you get q, you can calculate p as n divided by q, and then you can calculate phi, and then you can calculate d, and it's broken. Right, so common factors is, a, is a, an actual problem in, for instance, embedded systems, because if you generate keys very soon after boot, there is not much entropy in the system, and you might actually end up with a case where the um, random, say, random functions that generates the random numbers p and q actually generates the same p or the same q twice for t for two different uh, RSA keys I if I if it's done very soon after boot uh, yeah if the number e is a very large number then you might think that it's something fishy maybe they, they did something wrong in the implementation so in the normal case you s you choose a small e and then you calculate d all right 
but if this uh, <laughs> uh, large e, then maybe they did it the other way around. Maybe they chose a small d and calculated e, then e will be large. Well, what happens if it, it's a, a small d? Well, d is the, the number that is secret. Yeah, then it's easier to break. So there are two uh, efficient algorithms to break it. Uh, the one is called Wiener's algorithm, the other is called Bone Durfee algorithm. So check it out in, uh, in the book or online. And then you have this Shor's algorithm that can actually uh, factor any n and get back p and q, but um, Shor's algorithm can only be run if you have a quantum computer. So this is a lot of fuzz about this. If someone manages to actually invent a quantum computer that can work with like 4096 bit integers and factor them, then RSA and most other public key algorithms and Diffie-Hellman too, I think, are completely broken. I think even elliptic curve uh, is broken, which is similar to RSA, uh, but different. <laughs> Shor's algorithm can break that too. Uh, one thing that can happen if you, for instance, calculate one large p and then think, well, p is so large, I just take q, the next, the next prime number of the p. B but because p is so large and if p and q are similarly also large, it will be impossible to break. But it's not, because the both p and q will be near the square root of n. And square root of n is a, a mathematical function that is easy to calculate. So if you calculate the square root of n and then just take the next prime number or the previous prime number, you will get p or q. You can check in some database of known primes, the factor db. So they have a large number of primes in there. Uh, so you can uh, just enter n there and see if, if uh, the number is in the database. Side channel attacks, that's a little bit complicated, but you basically measure something like the timing, for instance, f the, the, the computer takes to dec do decryptions uh, or the, and, uh, the power consumption, and uh, that uh, how much power is uh, used dr during um, decryption or fault injection, that's a hardware attack where you insert f uh, faults on a, uh, on a pin, on a physical pin on a ship that does the decryption. So all these are side channel attacks and there is also this acoustic cryptanalysis that you can listen with a microphone and uh, you know, see you might not hear it with the ear but the, the computer actually makes noise when it works in uh, <laughs> you know, uh, these capacitors and so on. They make a little noise which you can hear with the microphone and that, that might be enough to break the cipher, uh, <laughs> just listening to that noise. Uh, or a safe CTF tool is a tool you can find on GitHub, which can implement uh, some of these attacks. Yeah, so that was a special case study now into RSA, and it's interesting because if you play CTF, you will come across this. And now the last part of this uh, presentation is digital signatures. So what's that? Uh, well, if you have a file. Uh, you want to create a signature like if you write your signature with a pen on a paper. Um, the idea is that nobody else should be able to write your name in the same way. So if you inspect inspect the signature, you can see if the, it's the correct person who wrote it or not. But uh, if you use mathematics, it's actually much harder to, f to forge the signature. Um, yeah, so uh, one way you can do this, uh, it's similar to message authentication code. You have two algorithms, a signing algorithm and a verification algorithm. So the signing algorithms take uh, the input file and the secret key and out come this delta value, this uh, signature tag. And the verification algorithm takes the file and the public key and this uh, signature tag delta and out, no sigma, I mean sigma, uh, sigma for, for a signature tag and out comes true or false if the verification algorithm was correct. Yeah, so you here for instance could be a firmware update file. So may, let's say you work at a company uh, who makes firmware 
and you mo you want to um, uh, sign it so that the customer can use your public key to verify that the firmware update file plus the signature sigma uh, is correct because the idea here is that the attacker should not be able to create a valid sigma value a uh, valid signature for uh, even if they have the public key it's public it's not secret even if they had have the update file but they want to change if the attacker wants to change the firmware update file they should not be able to to calculate a sigma value a digital signature that can verify to true all right so you can use this for instance for instance like this uh, you can take uh, a hash value of the firmware file and add some padding the reason there are technical reasons for why you should add some padding that is to stop some s certain attacks and then you just um, and then you get this m value and you calculate the digital si signature as m to the power of the decryption uh, exponent d mod n so it's like inverse rsa and to verify you take m calculate m as uh, this is a signature value to the power of e mod n and then uh, you have the update file you, t you calculate the hash value for instance sha256 of the update file and compare if it's the same m as you calculated here if they are the same the verification returns true all right if they're not the same it fails so pretty simple scheme it's like encrypting with rsa but opposite the inverse you encrypt with the, the secret key the d and uh, um, then verify using the public key yeah uh, and, and remove the padding uh, b b before calculating the hash the padding is only there to stop uh, certain attacks uh, and finally if you for instance use https so you can um, uh, run this uh, nmap script SSL e uh, enum ciphers and then you get a long list with the different supported cipher suites so what is a cipher suites it's the combination of algorithms that you use uh, during an, an entire session so first there is a handshake well, first uh, it says okay this is TLS transport layer security all right right then there is an algorithm uh, mentioned and uh, that's used um, for key exchange in, in this uh, case elliptic curve diffie hellman right but how can uh, alice know that it's actually bob that she's speaking to okay then they, they use rsa and this verify scheme with digital signatures like i showed you in the previous slide okay then alice can be pretty sure that she's talking to bob and then they use normal symmetrical uh, cipher for the rec rest of the session so in this case it's AES256 algorithm for symmetrical cipher and then for uh, yeah in block mode uh, in CBC mode all right uh, change block cipher and f for uh, Mac uh, ha hash Mac uh, or HMAC they use the SHA384 hash function for the HMAC algorithm for to verify the integrity message authentication code all right so this long line here i hope you are now able to decode it what it means uh, and uh, as i explained on, on the slide with block cipher there is there is one exception the gcm mode galois counter mode i think stands for and then you actually don't need this last step the mac <laughs> because uh, it happens automatically in the GCM algorithm. Yeah, and there are some resources. Uh, the, the book, which all these slides are based on. Um, the course, the RSA CTF tool, which implements some of the attacks uh, against RSA. Feather Duster uh, is a pretty cool, um, cool Python uh, library. Uh, this for Python 2, for Python 3 is, is this one here, which implements some attacks, for instance, padding oracle attacks. So that's, um, yeah, if you're going to play CTF, I can recommend looking at this Feather Duster or Crypt Analyb 3, uh, especially for padding oracle, but it 
It can do a number of attacks, uh, pr pretty cool stuff. For Caesar ciphers, you can check on um, uh, this decode.fr. It actually uh, uh, can crack a large number of um, classical ciphers. Crypti.com can also uh, crack a large number of ciphers. Cyberchef is uh, a web application uh, created by the British intelligence service, GSHQ, Q, uh, which can also implement a number of algorithms. It's pretty cool, actually. Uh, I think it runs in JavaScript, in the web browser. And Quip Cube can automatically break uh, most monoalphabetical substitutions. It's actually remarkable. This guy who made this, he, he really knows what he, he does. This Edwin Olson, I think. So uh, in this PDF here uh, is some explanation of the basic, the first implementation. But he, after, after 2007, he implemented more statistics analysis methods so it's even more advanced now and that is all folks